this right here is the Sony PlayStation. Time to review it. The PlayStation brand is one of the biggest and most recognizable gaming brands to date. And this is where it all started. The very first PlayStation. Released back in 1995, the PlayStation is obviously Sony's very first gaming console. The story of how this console came to be is a pretty interesting one. So basically development of the PlayStation dated back to around 1992 or 1993. Um, basically at the time, Sony and Nintendo were collaborating to develop a CD add-on for the Super Nintendo to basically compete with the um, Sega CD add-on for the Sega Genesis. However, for some reason or another, Nintendo decided to back out of the deal behind Sony's back. And so Sony decided to continue the PlayStation project on their own. Hence, the Sony PlayStation, their very first console. With 32-bit graphical capabilities, the ability to use compact discs as a storage medium, the ability to play audio CDs, and home to some of the greatest games of the late 90s and even some of the greatest games of all time, the Sony PlayStation was a huge success for Sony, despite it being their very first console, and sold over 108 million units worldwide before being discontinued in 2006, just before the reveal of the PlayStation 3. The PlayStation 2 was my first Sony console that I had, so because of that, I never got to experience the original PlayStation, and I have more nostalgia for the PlayStation 2. This PlayStation console that you see in front of you right now, um, I actually bought off eBay as a broken unit, which it kind of works, like it turns on, but it has troubles reading discs. So I basically got it for the purposes of reviewing it and trying to fix it and sell it. This is the original design of the PlayStation that they ended up using until about the year 2000 when they released the PS1 Slim. Um, which obviously that model slimmed down the design, made it look a little more sleek. Um, and I think they also removed the internal power supply and also removed the reset button. I've also heard the PS1 Slim is also a little more reliable when it comes to the um, CD drive. All right, let's take a closer look at this thing. So obviously on the top of the system, we have our Sony logo and the PlayStation logo. On the right side, we have our power button for obviously turning the system on or off. And then this little indicator here will glow green when the system is on, and then obviously will be blank like that when it's off. And then we also have a reset button. On the right side, we have the open button to obviously open up the lid to the CD drive. On the front of the console, we have our two memory card slots and our two controller slots. Um, these are the exact same on the PlayStation 2 um, because I did mention in that video that you can use PS1 memory cards and controllers on PlayStation 2. The PS1 also had its own version of the multi-tap so that you can use more than two controllers with the system, just like the PS2 had. On the left side of the system, we just have nothing but um, an air vent. And on the right side, same thing. On the back of the system, we have our AC power, AV multi-out, which is the exact same connector that they used on the um, PS2 and even PS3. Um, on this particular model, we also have dedicated um, RCA video and audio out. So in case you didn't want to use the AV multi-out port right here, you can just use standard composite cables, which is pretty nice. We also have a serial port right here. Um, I want to say that is used for tethering multiple PlayStation systems together for like system linking. And then we also have a parallel port, if I can get it open. There we go. And this was used for a variety of different accessories. Um, I want to say there was a video CD decoder sort of thing that connected back here so that you could play video CDs with your PlayStation. Um, this was also used for cheat devices like the Game Shark, and this can also be used for um, other peripherals for um, obviously like modding the system and whatnot. 
this port did unfortunately get phased out with later models and same thing with the dedicated RCA composite out. On the bottom of the system we have four felt feet for obviously keeping the system from um, sliding around. Of course due to age they have unfortunately started to deteriorate. We also have some more vents here and then the sticker here is obviously detailing the model of the specific PlayStation when it was manufactured, um, the AC voltage as well as the wattage information, um, and other FCC nonsense. This particular PlayStation is model number SCPH-1001 and was also manufactured on October of 1996. Let's talk about the controller for the PlayStation, which anybody who knows anything about PlayStation, they have used this exact same controller design up until the PlayStation 3 when they finally decided to completely redesign the controller for PS4. This is the original DualShock controller for the PS1. However, it's not the original controller that came with the system when it first launched. The original controller actually did not have analog sticks, nor did it have rumble capabilities. All it had was a D-pad, start and select button, four face buttons, and your L1, R1, and L2, R2 buttons. That's it. They didn't end up releasing a PS1 controller that had analog sticks until about 96 or 97, um, which that one looked a little different compared to this one and actually didn't have rumble yet. Um, and then around, I want to say either 97 or 98, they released, obviously, what you see right here, the original DualShock. And they basically stuck with this up until the PS3. Anybody who's used a PS2 controller will also notice the design is legit the exact same. The only difference between the PS1 and the PS2 controller legit is... The analog sticks are a little tighter, um, it's got better rumble, and it also has um, pressure-sensitive buttons. So what exactly is powering the Sony PlayStation? Well, for starters, for a CPU, it uses a R3000 chip clocked at 33.86 MHz. For a memory, it uses 2 MB of RAM with 1 MB of VRAM. For storage, it uses proprietary 1 MB memory cards. For sound, it has 16-bit, 24-channel, AD PCM. For display resolutions, the PS1 supports 256 by 224 up to 640 by 480. For video outputs, the PS1 supports RF, composite, S video, and RGB SCART. And finally, the original design of the PlayStation measures in at 2.5 by 10.75 by 7.5 inches and weighs approximately 3.2 pounds. All right, let's plug this thing in and see it in action. Now, just to let you know, I literally don't have any PS1 games of my own in my collection. So I'm going to have to rely on my PS1 em emulator from my Raspberry Pi to show off gameplay. So just keep that in mind. But it, it'll literally look the exact same as if I was playing it on the actual console itself. Plus, even if I had any physical PlayStation games, they won't play on this because this thing has some weird um, CD reading issues. All right, we got everything all plugged in. Here we go. Get a nice little splash screen. And here's the main menu of the PS1. The design of the main menu depends upon which model of uh, PS1 that you have, um, which this one in particular has a pretty early BIOS. Um, later PS1 models, basically it's the exact same main menu um, under the hood, but um, aesthetically it just looks a little differently. All right, so we got two options here. We have memory card management, which is obviously what it sounds like. We can go in here and manage any save files that we have on our memory card, which obviously it looks like we don't have any data. And then the second option here is the CD player, which is obviously used to play audio CDs. All right, let's show off some gameplay. 
The graphical capabilities of the PS1 was pretty impressive back then. However, nowadays, it has certainly aged. Some games hold up better than others. Um, right now I'm playing NASCAR Thunder 2003 and it looks fairly decent for the system. But yeah, you can definitely, you can definitely see the 32-bit primitive 3D graphics here. The PS1 did have a few 2D titles, um, like X-Men Children of the Atom here, for example. Um, and most of those 2D games do hold up a little better compared to the 3D ones. Um, however, what I have noticed is um, the PS1, in terms of these sprite-based 2D games, um, it doesn't handle 2D sprite games as well as the Sega Saturn because, you know, the Sega Saturn, the Sega Saturn actually had like dedicated 2D hardware in it where the PS1 doesn't. So while the game looks pretty good for the system, um, there are some missing frames of animation for the 2D sprites and sometimes the system can struggle a little bit with the 2D sprites. So like, for example, I don't know if you can see it or not, um, since I'm recording at 30 FPS, but the game's running at 60 right now, but if there's a lot going on, then the system does tend to lag just a little bit. This is also a good time to bring up the controller because, well, obviously it's PlayStation. Every PlayStation controller is very, very functional. The buttons feel really nice and responsive. The D-pad's pretty good. Um, the analog sticks are nice and responsive too with barely any dead zone. Yeah, what can I say? It's responsive. It's a good controller, just, just like it should be. Something that does suck about PS1 games is the load times. Because the PS1 used a double speed CD-ROM drive, that means load times were, well, pretty lengthy, as you can see right here. Yeah, it's... <laughs> load times are not the strongest thing about the PS1. Um, I have noticed when you play PS1 games on PS2 and PS3, you do have the ability to um, increase the disc's reading speed, which definitely helps things a lot. But yeah, playing on original hardware, you can definitely tell those load times can be quite lengthy. Because the PS1 used compact discs as its storage medium, that means FM games were pretty common on the system. And <laughs> needless to say, these are some of those games that have not aged very well, <laughs> to say the least. But you know, I'm sure at the time it was a pretty impressive thing. Also because the PS1 used compact discs, the games had way more room for like full-on voice acting as well as CD quality audio, which is pretty nice, honestly. And there's many PS1 games that have fantastic CD quality soundtracks. Um, just to name a few, um, Wipeout has a really good soundtrack. Um, Final Fantasy VII also has a really nice soundtrack. Um, and Ein Einhander is another one that actually sounds really, really good for the system. And so, that was the Sony PlayStation. Despite the PlayStation being Sony's very first console, it did a lot of things right and was a huge success. Sony showed the industry they had what it took to make a great console. If it wasn't for this thing's success, I don't think PlayStation would be nearly as big as it is today. Now for the important question. Should you buy a Sony PlayStation in 2023? I guess it really depends on the person. For someone like me who never grew up with the original PlayStation, I wouldn't recommend it. I would just either download the PS1 titles that are available on PSN or just use an emulator. But for those who grew up with one, then yeah, I would definitely recommend it. The consoles themselves are fairly affordable. Um, and in terms of game prices, 
they can wildly vary. There's some games that are dirt cheap while others are ridiculously expensive. It, it really depends on the title. I don't really have a whole lot of knowledge on prices of PS1 games nowadays, so I can't really say anything about it. Older models like this one can have some issues with the disk drive due to age, so just keep that in mind. I'd say if you feel comfortable with buying an older model with the potential of having to fix it due to the CD drive, then yeah, I'd say pick up one of the older models, considering it has an internal power supply. Um, but if you don't want to bother with that and just, you know, play the system without having to worry about the um, disk drive issues, then pick up a PS1 Slim. So there you have it. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time.